This is the Week 6 College Football Recap, brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. You can check out all six of their sports books over at tunicatravel.com. I am Gary. I'm riding solo today. Chris is in Boston, Massachusetts, so I handled our recap for this week. Let's go ahead and jump in. First things first, the Red River Shootout. I'm not going to call it the rivalry. It's just ridiculous. The the Red River whatever. It's still the Red River Shootout to me. Bottom line here is that Texas looks like they're pretty good. We didn't know what to make of them after the TCU game, after the USC game. It's all based on perception, right? Like, is TCU actually that good? Is USC actually that good? Nobody is denying that Oklahoma is is good. And for Texas to come out and do what they did, they jumped up 45-24 to 24 early in the fourth quarter before the defense did what they sometimes do, which is give up points, right? A whole slew of them. So they kind of they kind of fell asleep a little bit, uh, but it was still an incredibly per, or, uh, impressive performance by Texas. Uh, look, at the end of the day, if you look at the stats, Oklahoma probably should have won the ball game. They had 9.17 yards per play. Texas had 6.68 yards per play. Like that's a lot of yards per play for Texas, but 9.17 is just ridiculous. Uh, Sam Ellinger. Just ridiculous, right? Uh, he was 24 out of 35, 314 yards, two touchdown or yeah, two touchdowns, passing, but then 19 rushes, 72 yards, three touchdowns uh, on the ground. I mean, that's just other world stuff. Ellinger looks like the real deal. They drive it down the field towards the end of the ball game, get the win thanks to Cam Dicker, Dicker the kicker, freshman kicker in a big time spot that was. Fantastic to see. Fantastic to see. We'll move on from that. Let's talk about Florida. Florida 27, LSU 19. This was a a, a slobber knocker of a game. It was nice to go from our, our Oklahoma-Texas matchup straight into LSU-Florida. We didn't know if this was going to be a good game. I will admit I did not believe in Felipe Franks. I didn't think that he would be able to do much against this LSU defense and no, the numbers say that he didn't really. He was 12 out of 27 for 161 yards. He threw one touchdown, threw one pick. But he was really good in spots. He did what he had to do to win the ball game. Florida, Dan Mullen's a good coach. He knew what it took to beat LSU. And and by gosh, I mean, they, they had 5.51 yards per play. Florida did. LSU only 4.95. Joe Burrow, three turnovers. And they were in, look, two of them in crunch time in critical spots, one at the very end of the game, uh, one on basically the last drive of the game that mattered. Threw a, a pick six when they were down 20 to 19. All they needed was a field goal. Had he not thrown that pick, I mean, I've got faith in LSU's kicker to be able to, uh, to kick a field goal. I mean, they, he's been good all year. So, yeah, Florida looked, uh, looked really good. 215 yards rushing against that LSU defense is... Really good stuff. Really, really good stuff. From there, Notre Dame, 45, Virginia Tech, 23. Chris uh, gambled on Virginia Tech plus six at home. Look, Virginia Tech has not been good at home in prime spots. They just haven't, and it's been a long time since they have been. I'm not sure uh, why we all continue to believe in them. until, like I, I do believe in Justin Fuente. But until they show me that they can win one of these big-time matchups, it's all going to be matchup-based, right? Like, Notre Dame just had the better team. Yes, it was 17-16 to at the half, but honestly, Notre Dame was up 10 to nothing, you know, at the drop of a hat early in this ballgame. There was, it, it was never really a ball game. Uh, you come out in the second half, Notre Dame comes out at Virginia Tech, five plays, they punt, and then Dexter Williams has a 97-yard touchdown run. Just ridiculous. And and they never looked back. From 17 to 16, it got way up there. Virginia Tech only scored one more touchdown. Uh, Notre Dame looks really good with Ian Book. That defense is fantastic. Uh, they, did, uh, they did give up a lot of yards. But Dexter Williams, 
I mean, 17 rushes for 178 yards and three touchdowns. Ian Book, I mean, his stats are just incredible every week. It feels like 25 out of 35, 271 yards, two touchdowns and one pick. That's uh, that's good stuff. This this kid could end up finding himself in the Heisman race even without playing the first three weeks of the season. Like, that's how insane this is. So I, I fully expect Notre Dame to go undefeated the rest of the way. Their schedule sets up incredibly nicely. Uh, I mean, they've got Florida State coming in. They play at Northwestern. Like, these are all okay teams, right? But, you know, do any of them scare you at all? Syracuse and the Bronx? Like, at USC could be interesting, but they haven't shown anything lately to, uh, or even for the first five weeks, six weeks of the season, to give you any doubt that Notre Dame would not be able to go in there and win that game. If USC loses a couple more games, there's not going to be a home field advantage there. So I look for USC to uh, to bow out Notre Dame to go 12 and 0. It's uh, I will eat crow. I predicted them to go 8 and 4 this season. I was dead wrong on that. Next up, Texas A&M 20, Kentucky 14. This game went to overtime. A&M held Kentucky to 70 rushing yards on 30 attempts. That's 2.33 yards per carry. Kentucky was running on everybody: South Carolina, Mississippi State, Florida. Like, this same Florida team that just beat LSU in the Swamp. I mean, they beat them in the Swamp. And they dominated them on both lines of scrimmage. It, it was crazy. But Kentucky does take the loss here. A&M, they got a good defense. Uh, but there are two turnovers. Like, they gave Kentucky a chance there. Uh, had Kentucky kicked that field goal in overtime, they still would have lost the game because, obviously, Texas A&M scored a touchdown. But there were a lot of, a lot of Kentucky backers that had them at plus five and a half, plus six, that some pushed, some lost. Uh, I was one of those that had them at plus five and a half. I, I would still take that bet even today, knowing what I know now. But A&M, that, Mike Elko looks like just a, a friggin' genius. He is a fantastic defensive coordinator. Next up, Mississippi State 23, Auburn 9. Auburn was held to less than 100 yards rushing for the third straight game. That has never happened in the Gus Malzahn era at Auburn. To be honest, uh, Auburn has never had more than two games in a season where they did not rush for over 100 yards. This is bonkers to me. Their offensive line looks completely lost. Running backs don't look good right now. I understand that they've got guys out, but everything just looks complete. They always find ways to, to generate rushing yards. And they're not able to do that right now. Nine points against Mississippi State, that's one thing. But when you give up 349 yards rushing to a Mississippi State team that rushed for what, 60 against Kentucky? That's, uh, that's cause for concern down on the plains. Gus Malzahn it is showing once, you are on the, uh, once you're on the hot seat, uh, you are never fully off of the hot seat. And, yes, he just signed a seven-year, $49 million deal, fully guaranteed. But that's not a fun way to make money, right? That's just not a fun way to make money. You're going to sit there in Auburn and have everybody hate you because they don't think that you're a good coach. And you could be in Arkansas where everybody understands that it's a rebuild. Auburn fans want to win now. They thought that you had the team to be able to win now. And, I mean, you see what's happening. But, yeah, 23-9 to loss at Mississippi State after State had only won, uh, or had only scored 13 points combined in two games against Kentucky and Florida. Not a good way to go about living. Number six, we're going to talk about Northwestern 29, Michigan State 19. We're going to give a shout-out to the West Lot Pirate Boys. Look, I thought the Northwestern was in trouble here partly because they lost two defensive starters before this ballgame. The week before, two guys were out. Michigan State finds ways to win close games like this. And Northwestern found a way to win this game with only rushing for eight yards total against Michigan State. That blows my mind. Now, Clayton Thorson, he had a pretty good day. 31 out of 47, 373 yards, three touchdowns. I mean, that's monster numbers. There is a reason why NFL scouts are salivating at this dude. They think he will be a first-rounder. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. 
Next up, number seven, NC State 28, Boston College 23. NC State averaged 6.13 yards per play on 87 plays. 87 plays. Boston College averaged 6.36 yards per play. They only ran 50 plays on offense. Now, A.J. Dillon was out. We get that. That's fine. But, goodness gracious, 87 plays to 50? I mean, that's just uh, that's bonkers. Bonkers to me. NC State looks really good. They have an off week. Clemson also has an off week this week. And then the only two undefeated teams left in the ACC will be playing in two weeks. So we'll be we'll be hyped up for that. I think everybody will be. Number eight, Miami 28, Florida State 27. This was an insane game, right? Florida State did exactly what an underdog is supposed to do. Get in their head a little bit. They had the, the pregame ruckus. The, the fighting and, and whatever, and it wasn't a huge fight. But, you know, they, they got in Miami's head a little bit. They jumped out to a 27-7 to lead. 27-7. to And couldn't hold on to the lead. Just so frustrating. I, I would imagine for Florida State fans, right? Uh, Florida State averaged only 3.08 yards per play on 65 plays. Miami averaged 3.92 on 78 plays. The efficiency here was not good for either team. Uh, but Florida State still looks lost. Like, they, they had some good moments in this game, which, I mean, you have to when you're in the underdog role. But, goodness gracious. This was, uh, it was an ugly game, but it was fun to see two teams that absolutely hate each other. It was, it looked like it was a sellout uh, down at the Orange Bowl. It was interesting. Uh, number nine, Iowa State 48, Oklahoma State 42. This is the fourth time in three years that Oklahoma State has been upset outright as a favorite. I mean, that's just not a good thing, right? Not a good thing. It's the second time this year uh, because Texas Tech went in there and absolutely handed it to them. Third-string quarterback, uh, let's see, uh, Brock Purdy, 18 out of 23, 318 yards, four touchdowns, 19 runs for 84 yards and one touchdown. That's Iowa State's third string. Third string. Give me a break here. 7.38 yards per play for Iowa State. What has happened to Oklahoma State's defense? I mean, I talked so good about them after the Boise State win. We all thought that Boise State was on another level for a G5 team, that that they were, and then they, of course, go into Stillwater, and Oklahoma State just smashes them. And ever since then, I don't know what has happened here. Uh, they they need to find something to, to fix here. I would imagine they're going to try and say that they need a quarterback change, something like that, but, I mean, Taylor Cornelius put up, 42 points here. There, there's something happening in Stillwater. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, number 10, we'll close out with this one. South Carolina 37, Missouri 35. Backup quarterback, uh, Skarnekia. Whew, South Carolina. 20 out of 35, 249 yards, three touchdowns. Missouri. You go into Columbia, you get caught in the middle of a rainstorm. There's delays, lightning delays, all that. Drew Locke was held to 17 of 36 for 204 yards and two interceptions. Missouri had 5.98 yards per play on 82 plays. South Carolina ran the same number of plays, had 4.6 yards per play. The If you listen to the S&P plus Bill Connolly over at SB Nation, the win probability for Missouri in this ballgame, because of all the stuff that happened, because of the stats, et cetera, et cetera, Missouri wins this game 96% of the time. And South Carolina found a way to get through it. And they definitely needed to because they have been reeling here lately. That will wrap up the Week 6 college football recap.